elected official who was very uh, unique and he, 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 breaks, he breaks the barrier when it comes down to innovation. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to bring up uh, State Senator James Sanders Jr. You know, what I really wanted to do in life is teach history. Yeah. <laughs> I really do. I, I wanted to teach history at the university level. Uh, imagine being paid to tell the truth. <laughs> Excuse me, what am I being paid to do? <laughs> Answer that question. <laughs> right there for the record. Uh, imagine being paid to tell the truth and imagine telling the truth and getting away with it. <laughs> not always. No, no, not always. This is a, the truth will always be a, 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 uh, a sparse commodity and always under attack. Uh, always under attack. But as I've seen, I've seen some of those posters say, if you think knowledge is expensive, try ignorance. So, but I don't have to say that to this audience. These folk are hungry for knowledge. They are different ages different stages, they are here. And the sign of an, of an intelligent person is that they can take a very difficult issue and make it very simple. If you ever bump into somebody who's speaking and you come away more confused than when you started, <laughs> it's because they didn't have the intelligence. An intelligent person can make a thing very simple. Very simple. And history, his story, well, there we go, thank you again. Uh, history is so critical. Some people say, oh, I don't like history. Oh, that's because you don't see your place in it. If you understood your role in history, you would love history. Uh, Malcolm X said of all subjects, he's found history the most, um, uh, the, the best one for his, for his purposes. And for my purposes, I, I commend all of these panelists who are going to take you through a part of your story, the greatest story never told, your story which is ongoing. Because every day you make history. You do. One writer, uh, one of our great leaders uh, of, of Africa said that the, the real battle of the oppressed people are to get into history, that we have to battle our way into history, that we're making everybody else's history but our own. There we go thinking again. So my job is easy, my friends. My job is to point out things and bring everybody together and then present some of the greatest minds in our area to you. So I'm, I'm, I've just about done it. Uh, I will reflect and, and tell you that uh, I think it was yesterday that they um, renamed a building in Washington, D.C., Chocolate City. In Washington, D.C., they renamed the Treasury Annex Building as the Freeman, Banks, Freeman Bank Building. Now, those who know their history will know that there's a, a bittersweet part of, of history, uh, an idea of the Freeman's Bank. Uh, and so much to say so so few times. If you want to hear more of this, you need to catch their class. And better still, not only catch their class, you make some history too. So as your senator, I'm glad to be here this evening to, to make this presentation. So I'm going to decrease so that we can hear some, some of this good stuff. And I'm going to sit in the back for a while and then they have me running to some other place doing wonderful thing, whatever these things are, I'm not quite sure, but they're wonderful, they quote me. So I, for those who I won't hear, I apologize, but I really thank you for coming out here uh, to the People's Republic of the 10th Senatorial District. It's a state of mind. I tell people I do not represent slaves. I represent the free. And no matter where the free find themselves, I am your senator. Having said that, thank you very much, and thank you, audience. Here are your educators. Educators, here are your students. All right.
round of applause to State Senator James Sanders. If you don't know the senator, I suggest you get to know him because he is a very wise man and uh, someone that we should all admire. The senator is a man of courage. He's a man of zeal, yet humble. He's an intelligent man, a man of truth, one who tempers his actions with wisdom, and above all else, one who walks in the light of God. Now, I would like to turn it over to the panelists. <laughs> and I would start with Dr. Kelly Carter Jackson. I'm so grateful to be here today. Thank you so much for inviting me. Um, I love what I do. I absolutely love my job. Um, and I love being able to talk about some of the greatest aspects of my job, which is teaching uh, African American history. Um, and for some of you who don't know, I actually teach a course not just on African American history, not just on the history of American slavery, but I also teach a special topics course called um, American Slavery in Film. And I actually want to talk about the Emancipation Proclamation today. One of the ways I want to talk about it is seeing this as the best film that's never been made. <laughs> so when we talk about the Emancipation Proclamation, um, some of you may be familiar with the document. I think it is one of the greatest documents to ever exist in American history. Um, and I don't say that very lightly at all. This document freed 3.1 million of the enslaved Americans out of the 4 million that were enslaved. So three quarters or 75% of the country slaves are freed by this document. How many of you guys saw the film Lincoln, Steven Spielberg's Lincoln? Okay, a couple people, <laughs> not very many. Uh, one of my grievances with the film was that it's all about the passing of the 13th Amendment, uh, which the anniversary of this is actually December 6th, 1865, so we'll be celebrating the 150th anniversary of this passing. Um, but when I saw the film, I was sort of disappointed and, and really disturbed because to me, the 13th Amendment is sort of the, the, the proclamation that announces the, the time of death, where it's the Emancipation Proclamation that really shows you how slavery died and how slavery gets killed pretty much on the ground. So what happens is, in the summer of 1863, Abraham Lincoln is in the middle of a war, the Civil War, and debating how can he strategically bring about a quick and expedient end to this war. And he comes up with this idea of the Emancipation Proclamation. It is not particularly new in the fact that during the American Revolution, there was also a similar doctrine called Lord Dunmore's Proclamation, which during the American Revolution basically said that anyone who is loyal to the king, you will be able to keep your slaves, but patriots who are rebelling against the slaves, you will lose those slaves. So all the patriots who were in rebellion against the king, their slaves would effectively be free. This also freed a lot of slaves during this time, one of the greatest documents to free slaves during this moment. So when you see the Emancipation Proclamation, it doesn't sort of just come out of um, nowhere. It's echoing past movements that have happened before. So when he issues this, a lot of people are actually against Abraham Lincoln and putting this forth. They say it's too radical, it's too big, no one's going to go along with this. And he says, this is what we need. We need a victory on the battlefield. And then once we have that victory, we can show that this would be a great moment to put forth this proclamation. So they have the Battle of Antietam, which is actually a stalemate, um, but they claim it as a victory, the North claims it as a victory, and five days after the Battle of Antietam, Lincoln issues his Emancipation Proclamation, and it does several things. It frees the slaves from the states who are in rebellion. That's really, really key. It does not free all the slaves. Like I said, 3.1 million out of the 4 million. So there are four states who are southern states, slaveholding states, but they don't secede with the South. So Maryland, Delaware, Kentucky, Missouri, 
they still hold on to their states because Lincoln says, if I free all of the slaves, then these four states might leave and go to the Confederacy as well because they'll say, why did you free our slaves? We're not in rebellion. So he frees only the slaves and the states in rebellion. This is huge. He does not provide a way for the slaves to get to the north. He simply says, if you can get out of Dodge, you're free, right? Slaves start leaving in the droves, in the thousands, in the hundreds of thousands. Um, this document really shows how African Americans freed themselves, in a sense, because they had to take the initiative to leave the plantation, and they do. Planters thought that they would never leave. Master said, no, my slaves are loyal, they will never leave. And in the moment the Emancipation Proclamation is set forth, uh, basically it gets issued in July, September, um, he puts it forth to the Confederacy. He says, you have till January 1st to follow through. If you don't, we are automatically freeing your slaves. Obviously the South does not, um, and they all of January 1st all of these slaves get freed by the Emancipation Proclamation it doesn't just do um, emancipation there's military necessity as a part of this as well so black troops if you've seen the film glory right came out in the 80s Denzel Washington you get your first black troops because of the Emancipation Proclamation so the 54th and 55th Massachusetts regiment that fight valiantly all throughout the country, for the first time ever, you have black men who are able to enlist in the military, and not just legitimately, but legally kill their former slaves. This is huge. This is really state-sanctioned rebellion, right? The fact that the US government says, you now can take up arms and go into the South and help us win this war. About 250,000 soldiers fight, both in the Army and in the Navy. Um, and Lincoln credits them for changing the tide of the war. It was never inevitable that the North would have won the war. In history, we say nothing is inevitable. The fact that these men join also changes the tone of the war. So now, instead of having a war in which we're fighting to bring the South back into the Union, now we're having a war to end slavery. If anyone tells you that the Civil War was not about slavery, they're lying to you. It is not about states' rights unless you're talking about states' rights over slavery, right? It is not about taxes unless you're talking about taxes over slavery. This is all an issue of slavery. And for African Americans, it was an issue of slavery from Jump Street. So now that you have African Americans who can, one, free themselves, two, African American men who can fight in this war, everything changes and Lincoln himself says that this is the greatest document that I have ever put forth and if I go down in history I want to be known for putting forth the Emancipation Proclamation. Um, I think this is huge because had you done a film on this right what you would have seen is a massive movement and migration of newly freed slaves moving into the north, moving away from their plantations. You would have seen black men and women, because there are some women who actually, I'm just giving a report on this in class, who actually disguise themselves as men and fight in the Civil War. There are black women who serve as spies in the Civil War. Harriet Tubman is one of them. Um, Harriet Tubman is all throughout the Civil War. She serves as a scout. So women are very much playing a role in this as well. It is a remarkable time, and I think that Spielberg really did the Emancipation Proclamation a disservice by not highlighting how important it is. When you actually get to the 13th Amendment, it really is just sort of a formality. Not only have the slaves freed themselves, but the four states that I was telling you about, uh, Maryland, Kentucky, Tennessee, West Virginia gets added to that, Missouri, Louisiana gets added to that. They free their slaves before the 13th Amendment even passes because they see the writing on the wall. They know, listen, slavery is dead, right? There's no way we're going to be able to resuscitate slavery. And so they wind up freeing their slaves. So by the time you get to the 13th Amendment, it's only really freeing a few thousand people, right? It's almost negligible the amount of people that are actually freed by the 13th Amendment. But it's necessary because it needed to be on the books. The abolition of slavery had to be on the books. So if you want to say that the Emancipation Proclamation is the murderer of slavery, then the 13th Amendment is really the examiner who comes in and says, time of death, right, 1865. That's exactly what's happening. So this moment is huge. Um, and, and I want to sort of end by 
saying that this moment is also highly contested, right? The Civil War is one of the most contested wars ever fought in America's history. It has the greatest <coughs> number of casualties that have ever died in American history. Over 617,000 men and women die in the Civil War. That's 2% of the American, uh, American population. 2%. That's a lot of people. That means everyone knows someone who died in the war or knows someone who knows someone who died in the war. These are huge numbers. Matter of fact, you can add up all the wars that have been fought in American history and the casualty deaths still don't come close to the amount of people that died during the Civil War. So it leads a lot of people to ask questions like why? How do we have all of these massive amounts of death? And what does this mean? What does emancipation mean? What does freedom mean? We are still grappling this question to this very day. Um, and that's part of my job, right? My job is to be able to not just look at history, but interpret history and really point us in a direction of where can we go to bring about progress? Where can we go to bring about change? Um, I'll end with this really good quote by W.E.B. Du Bois, the famous sociologist and historian, the first black PhD ever from Harvard University. He says, teach us forever dead. There is no dream but deed. There is no deed but memory. And essentially what he's saying in this quote is, it's not what you dream up, it's what you do. And essentially, it's not what you do, but it's what you how what you did and how it gets remembered, right? It's the memory that lasts more than anything. So when we think about history, it's not just about dreams, it's not just about deeds, but it's really about how do we remember, how do we memorialize, how do we commemorate these great acts that have happened in history? And what does it mean when we talk about the Emancipation Proclamation and few people really know what it did or few people know the huge impact that it has? It changes or colors the way that we see things and understand history playing out. So I really want us to be thinking about these themes, this idea of memory, this idea of commemoration as we end this moment of the sesquicentennial, the 150th anniversary of the Civil War. How do we think about memory and change and progress? And are we satisfied with, with where we are? Are we satisfied with how we've seen change play out over time? So thank you very much. Thank you once again, uh, Dr. Jackson. And I see we have a lot of children in here. So I would say tomorrow when you go to school, <laughs> your professor and your teacher, excuse me, says, Can you tell me about the Emancipation Proclamation? You'll have more information than she does. We'll be, we'll be teaching her. So next on our, our, our list, now that you were given this wealth of information, it's best to show you some visual. So I would like to present Shoshasha Brown. Thank you. Shoshana. Shoshana. <laughs> Shoshana. Hey, okay. Um, hi, everyone. Um, so as I was introduced, my name is Shoshana Brown, and I'll be speaking a little bit about um, uh, sort of the what the timeline looks like from slavery to where we are today um, and uh, what we're doing. Um, the focus of what I want to talk about is to really highlight um, the work that is done that is not told in history classes that often. Um, at the lower level, so high school, elementary school, middle school. I currently work in the middle school, so I definitely know what's in the classes. <laughs> um, and some of the things that I want to highlight. So we'll just start off. I'm going to stand over here, folks. Don't okay. Go through. So I'm um, not sure if folks can see, but from slavery to mass incarceration, um, so just to go back into slavery, um, black labor became um, the foundation, right, for our country. So foundation stone not only of the southern, southern social structure, but also of northern manufacture. This is a lot about what uh, Dr. Jackson just spoke about um, and sort of how slavery was so integral. But along with slavery, there was also this rebellion piece. 
So oftentimes when we think about history and we think about these big markers, we often um, don't highlight uh, as well as Dr. Jackson did the rebellion piece and the stance that people took advocating for not only themselves but their community. And that happened, right? So we look at Nat Turner's rebellion in 1831. We look at the work of Sojourner Truth and even all the way up in Albany. So I know for myself, sometimes it's hard for me to think of um, so how far up did the Underground Railroad go, right? Oh, thank you. <laughs> See me squatting. Okay, so I think about, you know, how far up did the Underground Railroad go? Um, and there's even, you know, houses far up north even as north as Albany here in New York State, right? Um, so in the Reconstruction era, after we moved from slavery into Reconstruction, um, the bravery of black soldiers and laborers was indispensable to winning the Civil War by the North. There followed by a heroic 12-year struggle against re-enslavement led by former slaves and abolitionists, which was lost when federal troops pulled out of the South and ended Reconstruction, right? So this talks a lot about um, how when after when we after the Civil War, when we were in Reconstruction, um, some of the struggles that happened, and even during then, right? We look at our Constitution and some of what Dr. Jackson just said, sort of looking at the the amendment as the the time period, the marker. Even in that, we see that slavery didn't end. It still is not done, right? Slavery still exists today. And so the way that it exists looks different, right? But it still happens. And so we have to be really conscious and really critical of what we're seeing because it's shape-shifting in front of our face at every second. We have to be able to track it. Um, so the 13th Amendment says, neither slavery nor involuntary servitude except as a punishment for crime, right? That's the key part, except as a punishment for crime, right? So slavery still exists as a punishment for crime, right? That was not outlawed. Um, so then we move forward from there. Between 1863 and 1965, we see a lot of lynching, an estimated 5,000 people were lynched in the post-Civil War period, right? So we look to where was the resistance for lynching, and we see a lot of work um, in the NAACP and with um, Ida B. Wells and looking at how do we protest, how do we rebel against what was happening to our people. When I say our, I'm talking about black and brown folk, so just to be clear when I say our people who I'm speaking of. Um, and then in 1877 to 1945, we see convict leasing, right? Um, convict leasing was a form of bondage distinctly different from that of the antebellum South. But it was slavery. It was a system in which armies of free men were compelled to do labor without compensation and then repeatedly bought and sold and were compelled to do the bidding of white of white masters through the application of extraordinary physical coercion, right? So we see slavery happening yet again in another form, taking free men and forcing them to be slaves again. Um, so we move forward from that and look at 1877 to 1964. We also see at the same time that that's happening, the Jim Crow segregation. Um, so how many people have heard of maybe Michelle Alexander, this book called The New Jim Crow? Okay, so this is where this comes from, right? Um, the Jim Crow segregation, looking at inequality and dis disenfranchisement, sort of this idea of separate but equal we know didn't work. Um, and what happened was there was a huge resistance. There was the civil rights movement. This is what everybody focuses on, right? This is the rebellion that is talked about in schools. This is the resistance that is talked about widely and publicly. But again, it's often watered down, right? We're often talking about um, 
you know, the Million Man March. We're talking about Martin Luther King. I have a dream speech. But we're not talking about the specifics. We're learning about Rosa Parks and maybe, you know, how the guest talks, Rosa Parks gets talked about how she was a little, little lady that was tired and just didn't want to give up her seat on the bus when we all know that that wasn't true. She was a trained organizer in the South, right? And she knew exactly what she was doing. And there was tons of preparation involved with starting that, right? Starting the Montgomery bus boycott and how that happened. That was not a by chance thing. It was a really intentional act of rebellion. Um, so I just want to go back to that. Resistance to segregation, legal and grassroots struggles. So we see this all over. We see the Black Panthers rising up, the Black Power Party, and Black Power and Black Liberation Movement. We see the Black Panther Party um, in the 1970s. Um, we see the, the back and forth, the rebellion of folks of color coming up. Um, we have Brown Berets, we have the Rainbow Coalition, we have the Black Panther Party, but then we have, you know, right back at us, CIA and other forces coming back. So there was a back and forth. Um, and we also see anti-war movements, women's liberation movements. So there's a lot of resistance that happens. Right now we're in a moment, and I'd like to challenge what Dr. Jackson said about sort of the moment that happened with Abraham Lincoln being, uh, being a really remarkable moment in history. And I'd like to say that right now is a really remarkable moment in history where we're seeing mass incarceration on a new level, right? We're seeing over 86,000 people um, incarcerated in New York State alone. That's about 56,000 in prisons and 30 in jails across the state, right? That's not talking about psychiatric institutes where people are relegated to be there in the confines of the civil courts, right? So we're talking about a lot of people that uh, mostly come from black and brown communities, right? That mostly come from communities like this one here, right? And go upstate and go far away and are taken out of their community. They're hard to reach, they're isolated and what that cycle does to us. So there's a huge amount of police repression, and the, the, there's a continuum that comes, as you can see, that I'm trying to draw here, from slavery all the way to today, and our youth walking to school, being targeted by police, et cetera, and then going into um, getting caught up in the prison, in what I call the prison industrial complex, or in general, sort of the criminal justice or injustice system, right? Where they get caught, you know, it starts with the stop and frisk, they begin to get targeted, the police know them, they're easy target, they get caught up, etc., and it spirals out of control. They get ends up, ends up the ends of the line is prison, re-entry, revolving door, right? So I'm going to skip forward past a few of these, um, a lot of these, <laughs> Uh, what I want to really highlight here are some of the rebellion or resistance, rather, right? That's what I like to say resistance that's happening today. So some of the resistance that we have going on is really vibrant. We have a really great movement going on that is on multiple levels. We're in the street and as well as um, on the legislative issue. So legislatively, we have put forth proposals like the Safe Parole Act, which I want to thank the Senator for being a sponsor of the Safe Parole Act, which is uh, legislation that we've put forward to help reduce incarceration by limiting the, uh, re limiting the power of parole boards to really be evaluate, evaluative, which they're supposed to be. They're supposed to be evaluating the safety of people returning and instead they are just saying well look what you went to jail for you should stay in jail longer they're resentencing they're not evaluating all of the things that the person has done oftentimes they they take less than 15 minutes with a case oftentimes the person who's up for parole isn't even in the same room they do it by video conference right 
So there are some real horrors around the way that we have our system set up that the senator is really coming forth to, to help support this work. Um, and then restoring funding for uh, education in prisons so that folks actually get rehabilitated. If this is about rehabilitation, then let's do our part and give them the opportunities that they need, right? Um, we're also talking about releasing aging people in prison. So if you look at the rate of reincarceration or some, something happening again, somebody doing something when they get out of jail, after they turn 65, the rate drops dramatically. So we're talking about a whole lot of elderly people still in jail, not at risk to society, but costing us a pretty penny, right? Because you have to imagine all of their medical bills, all of their elderly care that is on us as taxpayers as well. So we're looking at a cost of up to, I've seen up to $103,000 for prisoners who are maybe as elderly, need extra medical care, et cetera, right? So this is not just a human rights issue, it's also a money issue, a pocket issue, an economic issue, right? And so we wanna look at all of those things and really re redirect and shift the way that we're thinking about how we respond to violence. And this is not about letting everybody go, right? But this is about fairness and justice um, and allowing people the opportunity to rehabilitate themselves, including elderly, including youth, um, and as well as looking at the way the system works internally and changing that. Um, so I'll be happy to talk a little bit more, but I know we want to wrap it up. So thank you so much. Again, thank you, Shoshana Brown. And I will just say, you know, uh, this was a very, very uh, moving uh, uh, presentation that you had. You know, I'm an activist in the heart. And I just want to point out, I just want to thank you for, you know, uh, mentioning the, uh, the senator's uh, legislation uh, that, that he supports. And as I said, I'm an activist at the heart. And it's very important that we know our history. It is very important that we, as an African American community, take notice of these things and we come together in solidarity and take action. Now, I think this is actually a perfect segue to bring in our next uh, panelist, Dr. G. J. Cooper Owens. Much. Um, and I thank State Senator Jane Sanders Jr. and his staff for inviting me to be able to talk about something that I have literally dedicated um, much of my adult life to, and that is talking about the contributions, the lives, the triumphs, the, the, the sad moments um, of black people in this country. I teach at Queens College. Um, and I teach classes on slavery and the African American experience. And what I'm not going to do is what I tend to do in class. I'm also a walker and a talker, so I'm from the South, I talk a lot. So what I'm not gonna do is lecture you because 